Um, dear Earthmates, um, we are visiting uh, Professor Penelope J. Corfield in London. She is a leading historian focusing on the 18th century, but more than that, uh, global issues, including uh, climate change, gender uh, questions, and whatnot, uh, so many things. And I'm uh, a history fan, a learner, and I'm very excited. excited. Uh, uh, thank you, Penelope Corfield, uh, for accepting the invitation. And uh, um, why the 18th century? Hello, Tariq, and hello to everyone. And I am also, as was explained, I like the whole history of everything right back to the beginning and right on into the future. But in that, there is a particularly interesting period, the 18th century, we call it the long 18th century, so I don't mean absolutely literally 1700 to 1800, but this period from the mid 17th to the mid 19th century in Britain and in Europe, a time of great dynamism. It included exploration, innovation, creativity, invention, and its motto was trial and error. And we must confess, it also included some major errors, especially participation in the slave trade or the trade in enslaved Africans. But one of the things that I like about the 18th century, that it was a very reflective era. They began to worry about poverty or environmental degradation, and they campaigned, or a percentage of them campaigned, to halt the trade in enslaved people and to campaign against slavery. Well, as we know, these campaigns are not finished, but at least these were making major steps to alert people to the importance of how humans live together on the finite resources of planet Earth. So I find it a very fascinating period because it made great errors, but also because it tried to put them right. Something we need to do today. And actually, looking at it, um, the 18th century seems to be almost the basis of the present world. I mean, we've got to go at least uh, back to the 18th century to understand the present issues as well. So, oh, Yes, I do definitely agree with that, but I also argue that there are some deep continuities that run right through history. And so I don't like to say everything changes in one period no. or in another. But yes, it is a period when there are significant changes, but there are also deep continuities. True. Uh, David Hume uh, has been one of my favorite philosophers. Uh, and um, uh, uh, looking at the big events, uh, full of excitement, uh, full of, uh, I mean, wonderful, um, a wonderful period, yes. Um, well, yes, and if I may just add, Hume also, yes. a major philosopher, but also tried his hand at history. It was a very important period when British people tried to work out how they fit into the big picture in history, which remains my concern today. Mm. Yes. Um, thinking about Britain and Japan, both are islands and both became were, were empires. Uh, maybe uh, becoming an uh, being an island uh, had its uh, uh, motives, motivations. Uh, uh, geography does play an important role, but is it a coincidence that Japan and England, Britain, both became 
uh, empires. No, that is a very interesting point, and there are indeed some marked similarities, which I have discussed <coughs> also with my Japanese colleagues. But we can't take a position. I mean, it, it is partly yes. It's it's a hub of exchange being off the main continent. But Britain, for example, is a hub of exchange between the European continent, the mainland. Of course, it's part of Europe, but mainland Europe and the Americas, and then trade around Africa to the wider world. <clears throat> Japan also is a hub, but we can't just take a position of geographical determinism, because in earlier periods, Britain didn't play that role. And in for a long time in the 16th century, for example, Japan was quite cut off by its own policy. So it's, it's history as well as geography. But yes, geography can be very significant. And Britain, in a way, in the 18th century, is like the Silicon Valley, the, the exchange of ideas hub. But it won't always be like that. So we can't just say back to the 18th century or whatever. The, the dynamic of the whole is always changing. By the way, uh, I can't help, uh, help asking you your opinion about Brexit now. I, it, it just came to my mind. What is your evaluation? about that i was not a supporter before the referendum i'm less and less of a supporter afterwards and seeing the problems that are following but in the long run i actually believe that britain's destiny is part of the european trading cultural political block including Ireland, of course. I mean, it's a ridiculous situation now that Ireland is in the European Union and Britain is not. But I, my view is that we will realign rather gradually and then everyone will suddenly realise we've realigned rather than having another big row on a yes-no binary basis. That's my personal thought. <laughs> I may say, when I was much younger, I would not have considered myself European. You know one can have multiple identities. I'm a Londoner, I'm an Englander, I'm a Brit. But at a certain point, I would have said, yes, I'm a European. And now I think, yes, I'm a European. And I'm also citizen of the world. So we can have these many levels. Yes. In, in the long term, I am sure that Britain's destiny is in greater Europe. Mm, great. Um, how did you decide to become a historian? When did that love start how did it start and develop i'm so interested you asked me that question because i don't think there was one moment but i can say from when i was very young i was always interested for example to look at someone an older person think i wonder what you were like when you were younger or to look at some houses in the streets and think i wonder how this place was a hundred years earlier or 500 years earlier. So I was always interested in moving my mind through time. And that remains with me wherever I travel. I'm looking, you know, I wonder what this was like earlier or what it will be like later. And then sometime when I was about 12 or so, I was mentioning this, I'm not in those words, these are my adult words. And the person said, oh, that's called, I said I wanted to study. The person said, oh, that's called doing research, Penny. You can just research into the effects of time, and it's called doing history. So, right, that's me. So I had the interest beforehand, and about 12, when somebody told me the words for saying it, I could say, when people said, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to do research, history, and but talk to everyone about it, and that's how I still feel. Yes, and uh, a historian is a detective uh, also, uh, and... Uh... I'm sure you're enjoying doing research and writing uh, the way Agatha Christie was probably, you know, imagining and planning her novels. Oh, yes. And one of the things we say is that we must not have, we must be open to the clues and evidence we find. Nowadays, we look at all evidence, not just written evidence, but the evidence of houses and textiles and excavations and songs and humor, anything we can find, but we have to test it always and check 
for its accuracy. And then we develop our ideas from that. So we don't come, or we try not to come, with preset ideas, but to be a real detective and find out what is happening. Of course, one has some ideas because we, are, we don't have blank minds, but we try not to have a preset agenda. Mm. So, for example, if I'm detecting the crime, I don't say in advance, I know that you are the villain. <laughs> uh, true. Um, it's sad that, uh, like many lessons in schools, history, uh, at least in my experience, apart from my year in the United States, was usually boring, despite the pleasant attitude of the teacher. Because this is what happened. This is happened. It was like a dead material, unfortunately. Uh, uh, there was no connection. Con uh, we were not invited to uh, make use of that knowledge or discuss what what do f historians disagree about. For example, this is for me a very exciting thing. So, unfortunately, we were expected to memorize certain things, and uh, it was boring. Unfortunately, yes. uh, but how should I, uh, how should uh, history lessons be, really, in schools? Yes, I'm so sorry to hear you say that, but many people have said that to me. Uh, but we are, especially the younger teachers, are now trying much more adventurous mechanisms. So certainly, they should include debate and discussion. It is absolutely central for history not to be told it is this, it is this, it is this, and you must learn it, but to discuss. And in every era, in every period, in, there are always something to discuss. For example, in the 18th century, we say, why did people accept the slave trade? And why did it take them so long to open their eyes? And then this makes people think, oh, well, why did they? And it's, of course, it's a good question because they were discussing that in the 18th century, the reformers were saying, what can we do to open people's eyes so we can discuss the issues at the time? The other thing that is very helpful is to do, to get people to do projects about their own communities, locally, where they are, and their families. I am not against, as some historians are against, family history. On the contrary, that is another way, a very personal way of looking at the effect of change over time. And you know, it's very, very common when people's parents die, people say, I wish I had asked them more about what life was like when they were young. So a very good project to get people going is to ask people about their family, or if not everybody has their own family with them, then the, the primary carers, people have carers, and they can understand. And it just seeing yourself or putting the individual in a community and into a longer term process and also discussing it. So I would never say history is a list of facts to learn, though I don't like to have complete errors in the history. So we, we want the facts, it, it, what we know, we want to be accurate, we don't want fake history, but nonetheless it has to be discussion, exploration and related to people's lives. And when they do that, they love it. Yes, and uh, of course, historiography uh, is closely connected uh, to politics necessarily, and we see omissions, significant omissions by governments uh, uh, or uh, uh, rewriting history, Holocaust denial, for example or um, the, the the Armenian tragedy uh, omitted completely in Turkish history books. Um, uh, so a historian is necessarily a politician too, uh, in a way, uh, uh, in a good sense. How do you feel about that? In the good sense that you mean, I try to be a citizen of the world when writing. I mean, obviously, everybody in the world comes from somewhere and has some background and some assumptions and attitudes. 
but we are not just writing our autobiographies saying, look, this is me, this is what I think. We're trying to look at the history of all humanity that we share and debating it. And I do think in that sense, the historians are trying to be citizens of the world. If they want to be propagandists or publicists, then they can do that. That's a, that's a separate job. But to be the historian, you should try. So sometimes it may be your own cause that has done bad things or gone wrong. You know, I'm not just writing that how, let's say, for example, Britain did everything right or, or London, you know, my city, you know, everything London did. So we're trying to take a wide view because the other thing I believe that we are all one great human family. I know this is something you want to talk to me about with many different branches, but we share. So I take the view that anything done by humans, this is not an original thought from me, but it's a quotation I love to quote. Anything done by humans can be understood by other students if we study it carefully. So even horrors and terrible things we can study and understand, not to copy, but to understand. So I do know that some societies try to airbrush their histories, but the resources of the world, the world repertoire of knowledge, will eventually break in upon them. People who are brought up in these traditions suddenly realize there is a wider world. They come across someone who tells them differently. They look it up and they debate it. So the world has a collective resource of shared history, and we must preserve it together and debate it together. It's very, very important. So as well as our own local history, national history, regional history, there is the history of humanity. True, true. And uh, uh, world history is a project uh, very difficult uh, but necessary. Um, I wonder if UNICEF has uh, focused on uh, in inviting historians from around the world so that they can produce um, a simple, relatively, uh, world history for all children in the world that can transcend national barriers to, to as, as much as possible um, I mean, because history is a story in a way, and we need some basic, uh, the least common denominator, let's say, uh, so that we can uh, improve our connections globally. I don't know really if UNICEF has that on the agenda, or maybe they've already done it. Um, I don't think there's anything like that so far, but it's a wonderful idea. I will think and see what I can do. To promote at the moment the most of the sharing is happening among researchers which is all very very important and of course it's all open to debate so when you mention something like holocaust denial or the study of the holocaust that has been based on years of research from researchers from many many countries in the world so we're not just looking at sort of either german or anti-german but many different researchers so i think we are building up that corpus of knowledge and trust but i i don't think we've got yet to a, gl a single global story and it would have to be you know it's quite difficult it has to incorporate conflict and you know the his the human story is full of conflict and hostility as well as you know we don't want just the sort of it's all love and sweetness I mean, we true. wish it were all love and sweetness, but it isn't. True, true. Um, I'm on the uh, advisory board of uh, uh, Pan International Peace Committee, and we are focusing on children's rights, preparing a document, trying to, and I'll bring up this issue so maybe uh, we can include uh, UNICEF, etc., and initiate something. At least the goal should be there. Uh, I agree. Yes, yes. Um, how can I not ask you anything about Shakespeare and history? <laughs> uh, as an admirer of Shakespeare, of course, and I translated Hamlet into Turkish, by the way. Oh, well done. Uh, it was the tenth uh, translation into Turkish, and uh, the critics have been generous, uh, etc. But 
Uh, what, what do you think about Shakespeare and his, his attitude to history? Well, I am a great fan of Shakespeare and even deeper than his study of history, his attitude to time. He is very, very interested in the passing of time and he, he has in uh, Richard II, I think it is a wonderful cry, oh, bring back yesterday, but it can't be done. But he's aware of transience as, uh, and as, as well as you know, the good things in history, the tragedies, the dramas. So I, I see him as part of this process, I was saying that when Britain becomes a hub, a changing point, a, a, a transition point between many different places related to the spread of trade and transport and pirates and all the rest. And I feel this sense of change impacting on a traditional society that Shakespeare is picking up on and articulating completely brilliantly. And interestingly, in the 18th century, the period I'm talking about, there's a big recovery of Shakespeare I mean, he'd always been known, but he'd slightly been allowed to you know, become a bit historical. And then suddenly they recover Shakespeare and uh, they had the big Shakespeare commemoration. And this is when he becomes the great bard and dramatist for Britain and as the British culture spreads for the world. So we sort of, in the 18th century expansion, we take Shakespeare with us. Yes. And uh, there is this uh, uh, Richard III society uh, opposing the image of Richard III as drawn by Shakespeare, defending the moral, uh, um, what's the word, rehabilitation of his fame? Or That's yes. very interesting. Yes, yes. And, of course, uh, fiction is not the same as history. So in, in, in many areas, there are disputes from historians saying the real dot, dot, dot is different from their fictional or mythic um, reputation. But I, I think that is part of the interest of history. It is there as a factual record for us, but it is also a stimulus to the mind and creativity. So. I love historical fiction, and I don't say, you know, people must not do this, but I do say, but we mustn't take all these fictions for literal truth. And, you know, there is a difference between the imaginative creative intellect and, and the literal survey. And we need historians to be the practical, saying, oh, it wasn't quite like that, and let's look at this detail and that. But we don't need to lose the human imagination. It's part of how we respond to how we've moved through time and it's very going to be very crucial for how we cope with the future. That's true. Um, so uh, a, a historian is necessarily a futurist at the same time, while, uh, you know, because when you write something, you have the vision of some sort of future and your wishes. So uh, although you may not directly refer to the future, it's with you isn't it? Yes, I, I do agree with that. I don't think all my colleagues would, but I do. For example, one of the things I say, having looked at patterns of continuity and gradual change and rapid change over time, I, I call this a sort of braided history with the different levels of deep continuities, gradual evolution, but all sorts of bumps and upsets and turmoil in the system. And I see that as happening in the past therefore i can say the future isn't completely unknown in my view it will have some elements of deep continuity some elements that are continuing with gradual change like the evolution of the human genome and it will have some areas of turmoil we can guess at some of them coming from climate change but we can look at the and try and work out how we're going to cope with the balance of all those hmm. And uh, can one disregard Karl Marx and Engels uh, as a historian? No, we should take them very seriously. Where it became a problem, in, in fact, the early pages of 
the Communist Manifesto have a brilliant survey of uh, in, in change in economic history. But where it becomes a problem is this is taken as the only model for change, that revolution must happen only in this way and only from economic causes. So there are problems if it is taken too literally, but if it is asking us to look at the importance of economic issues and the, 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 the conflict between people with vested interests in things being one way and people who wish to change in another, it's a very, very powerful historical model, but it must be used in a flexible way, not simply simple prediction. And just as we found, the Marxist parties and the Marxist governments did not find history evolving as they had predicted it to be. But if we take it in a looser sense, the importance of economic issues and challenging vested interests, so, so important. And look at the problems for climate change. We must take a global view and we must look at the interests of all of humanity, but there are vested interests people with economic and social interests in keeping things as they are and behaving so destructively. This is a really, really big issue that we have to tackle now. The world has to tackle, when I say we, the world has to tackle yes. now. True. Uh, what would you like to suggest to young Earthmates? I have the following suggestion for everybody. First of all, it's three, three points. First of all, we must keep optimism of the will. It is crucial to keep optimistic. It is not the right thing to bury our heads and scream with horror, although there are major problems, not just coming soon, but coming now. So, but we must keep optimism of the will. That is very important. The next one goes with this. We need flexibility, intelligent flexibility of the mechanisms to cope. So we must not just have one simple plan and say this will always be the plan. We must be flexible in an intelligent way. So um, not pessimism of the intellect, but flexible intelligence of the intellect to go with optimism of the will. But lastly, and absolutely importantly, we must have solidarity between all humans on our shared planet. And so that will mean we are one big human race with many branches. That will mean some changes to economic policy, not a literal equality in financial and economic terms, because that is too difficult to operate but some big global policies to attack and challenge the extremes of poverty and the continuing problems of semi-slavery or semi-slavery, neo-slavery, but also to redistribute some of the great wealth as well. So it's not a policy of total equality because that's too hard, but it's broad sharing of solidarity between all humans and removing the extremes of wealth and poverty. So we're doing this together, and that is the absolute crucial thing, together, but optimistically and intelligently. Wonderful. And uh, what is the article you're writing these days, or what is the topic that is exciting to you, to you these days? The ideas I have just stated come from the end of a book I am just finishing, which will be called Telling the Time, How Humans Study the Past to Face the Future. Not to predict the future, but to face the future. Wonder so I'm waiting to find a publisher right now, but when it is done, I would love to have an interview to tell you more. Wonderful. So our next appointment is in the horizon. I'm delighted. Uh, 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 Professor Corfield, is there anything else you would like to express now? Uh... Oh, thanks for the chance to speak to everybody. Make history fun. Don't think of it as boring. And if 
if you think of it as the history of all of us, of course it has to be fun and enjoyable because that is how life has to be. So enjoy your history. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Penelope Jane Corfield. Thank you. We're together. I enjoy saying this at the end. We're together. Thank you so much for the invitation and good luck. And we will proceed to talk to UNICEF. Wonderful. Dear Earthmates, well, another wonderful episode is uh, unfortunately almost over, but all this uh, ideas of Penelope Corfield will be with us. We are excited, joyful, despite all the negativities in the world. We are together. Yes. See.